Tucker Goodrich, thank you for coming on the podcast. Could you start with like an introduction of what you've been researching and why people should listen to you, basically? Well, um, I am... Boy, how did I get into this? So I had no interest in diet or nutrition or anything else except for doing the minimum required to keep oneself healthy, which I assumed was follow the government dietary guidelines and eat lots of whole wheat and blah, blah, blah. Um, And then I started getting sick. Um, At the time, I was the chief technology officer for a big hedge fund in New York City, got hospitalized a bunch of times and started looking into my health and through some serendipity discovered that if I stopped eating seed oils and inflammatory bowel condition I'd been suffering from for about 16 years stopped in two days. And then all the rest of my health started getting better almost immediately. I lost weight. I developed a resistance to sunburn. You know, I mean, I'm blonde, blue eyes. I'm supposed to roast like a tomato out in the sun. And I now live here in the Idaho high desert and can go all day without sunscreen and not get sunburned. Pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty, pretty dramatic difference. And it enabled me to fire my doctor. And that was back almost 14 years ago at this point. Um, Living pretty much excellent health ever since, I think. Other than getting bitten by a tick and having a minor dental issue a couple of years ago, um, I've been perfect health. So it's been a good, it's been a good adventure. And then I discovered that it worked for other people I was working with and helped some of them, including a fellow who'd been diabetic for his, you know, entire 40 year adult life and helped him get back to his high school weight. And, um, you know, started realizing that this was something that could add a lot of value to people. And I've Mm. continued to research what happened to me and why most importantly, and figure out how it can apply to other people. Yeah. Uh, So I just want to, you said that vegetable oils, I want to make sure people know what we mean by that. So another thing they're called is seed oils. So it's like cotton seed, rapeseed, peanut oil, sunflower oil, anything from a seed basically but things like olive and avocado uh, well they're actually fruits so that's a bit of a different thing i know we, there are some issues we can talk about with them but anything from a seed yeah, or so, a bean or a nut yeah so you've got it exactly it's a vegetable oil is a oil that comes from a vegetable <laughs> which can be either from the fruit or the seed right So, for instance, an olive, you have the soft part around the pit, right? The pit's the seed, the soft part's the fruit. Generally, good olive oil is made just from the fruit. Um, There are some poor grades that are where they crush the whole thing up and use all the fats. Um, And the primary difference that's important between a fruit oil and a seed oil are the fatty acids that make up the oil. And fruits tend to have... High fat fruits tend to have a better fat composition than seeds do. Um, And the fat composition is what appears to be important for our health. Yeah. For a variety of reasons, which is what we're going to be talking about here today. Yeah. So I think a a good place to start and where this started to make sense to me was kind of from the evolutionary standpoint of how hard it really is to get a large quantity of these fats um and another thing i realized recently um a couple weeks ago i spoke to anthony chafee um dr anthony chafee he's a carnivore doctor and Mm -hmm. a principle from the kind of carnivore community is that these plants don't want you to eat their seeds right Uh, as that's their child and that's going to carry on the next generation but with seed oils, you're taking a bunch of plant babies and mashing them all up, which is not what they want. They don't want you to eat them or crush them. They want you to eat the fruit. The seed goes through you and then germinates and comes out the other end. So that was something I also realized was that kind of fits with that paradigm that they don't want you to 
eat their seeds and you're eating them in massive quantities. Well, that I think uh, that holds really well for things. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my parents told me not to eat apple seeds or, you know, eat the peach pits because they were high in things like cyanide and arsenic. And I think that's a better example of what you're describing where, you know, the, f the fruit is actually meant to be eaten so that you will, as you said, disperse the seeds all over the landscape. Um, and, uh, you know, that's certainly really, really true for plants like wheat, for instance, where they actually contain pesticides that kind of that affect insects and also us and are designed to discourage you from eating their seeds. This is more a case. Um, I mean, the fats that we're talking about are ubiquitous in organisms, um, plants and animals. So they're used for various things in the bodies. Um, and, you know, in plants, they're used throughout the organism, not just in the seeds. Um, so I think this is more of a case of taking too much of what could be potentially a good thing, as one of the researchers I talked to said, um, you know, that these are these are things that we're supposed to be consuming and we're just con be consuming vastly more of it than what we're supposed to do. And these particular fats have negative effects, which are one of the reasons why they're beneficial to us in the appropriate dose. But when you start taking massive doses of them, you start overwhelming these systems. And, you know, because in the environment they're rare, relatively, we never evolved rate limiters to protect us from overconsumption of them, right? There was just never any need. So now we're, thanks to uh, industrial processing, we can, you know, extract vast quantities of these fats using, you know, industrial scale processing of the various different seeds. And we're getting doses that are, you know, depending on who you talk to, 20 to 200 times what we're designed to expect in our diets. Yeah. And well, the, the interesting thing is they're actually kind of encouraged to consume these um, due to, well, lowering LDL cholesterol is one main reason. Um, but right. There's, it was from you, I'm pretty sure I heard this as like a pretty uh, convincing. I mean, this is from a paper, a medical paper said like soybean oil consumption is increasing worldwide and par parallels with a rise in obesity. Uh, it's rich in unsaturated fat, especially linoleic acid. Uh, it's assumed to be healthy, but it induces obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance, and fatty liver disease in mice. So there is, uh, yeah, some evidence and, that this is not good. Yeah, and in humans. I mean, it's all mm. been demonstrated in humans as well. Um, you know, so yeah, we... Probably the two biggest changes that occurred, well, as far as nutrition, diet and nutrition goes, the two biggest changes that occurred to humanity in the 20th century were the massive increase in the amount of oils from seeds we are consuming um, and the massive increase in what we call variously chronic diseases, diseases of civilization, Western diseases which are all the diseases that are not caused by a pathogen, right? The people used to die primarily from things like pneumonia, obviously caused by bacteria. And now we are primarily killed by things like in order, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, the, side, the various side effects of diabetes, which are of which heart disease is one um, and other obesity related you know, there's this suite of diseases that are correlated with each other and that have come on in the human populations and interestingly in all of the animal populations that depend on us for food, like your pets, right? We have here in the United States an obesity epidemic amongst cats and dogs. Um, and 
pigeons in New York City. I mean, it gets pigeons. a little crazy. Wow, wow. I knew dogs was like 60% obesity or something crazy, but I didn't hear about the pigeons. I think it's all, yeah. Last I, there was a not for profit that ran for about five years. And the last report they had was, I think, like 68% obesity in pets. Um, and if you look at, you know, if you go look at what dog food companies are told by the government, it's a government regulated industry to put in their dog food, it looks very much like the American dietary guidelines, which have been adopted by governments all around the world, including in the UK. Um, and the same change is what they do in laboratories, right? So you've got an increase in fats from seeds. In labs, this happens mainly because they think it's healthy, they think it's essential for health, and it's cheap, most importantly, is why we're all eating it ultimately, right? Um, but one of my favorite experiments was comparing a lab diet, a standard lab diet called D12492, which is made by a company called Research Diets. And they sell it to scientists all around the world with the promise that if you feed your lab animals this, they will get obese and diabetic. Great. And then they compared it to a human medical food, food called Insure. Okay. Insure is made by what used to be called Abbott Pharmaceuticals. Now they're just called Abbott because they do more than pharmaceuticals, I guess, whatever. And it is a, so they compared the obesogenic, diabetogenic, right? The food D12492 formulation to ensure this human food that is given to patients in hospitals to allow them to gain weight. And they have very similar lists of ingredients and they have the exact same effect on laboratory animals they cause. So physicians have known since the first advertisement I found for a food like this was from the 1950s and the famous actress Raquel Welch was hired to say, eat this food called Wait On, and it's a very similar formulation to ensure. And ladies, you will no longer suffer from being too thin. You will start to put on weight and look voluptuous like I do, right? So, and this was an advertisement in the British Medical Journal, right? So physicians have known since the 1950s how to make people put on weight, right? Laboratory scientists know exactly how to make animals to put on weight. And the dietary guidelines follows the exact same formula. And then they act surprised that humans everywhere have put on weight. Yeah. When I first was started to hear about these vegetable seed oils, I was like, oh, okay, they're probably just, you know, bad for like a couple things. But then I've got a list here, like... I was actually <laughs> surprised, like absolutely blown away by it. It's so many things linked to like cardiovascular disease, obesity, and mitochondrial dysfunction, sunburn, skin cancer, fatigue, even like ACL tears. So like weak ligaments, Alzheimer's, dementia, yep. allergies, like it just goes on and on. And I was like, how is this messing up everything? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it is. Uh, I've, so far been unable to find a chronic disease that isn't linked to seed oils in one way or another. Um, and when you start to understand the mechanism of what's going on here, it's not too surprising that it would affect every single part of your body, right? Because primarily the effect is starting at the mitochondria, right? Now the mitochondria for the two second biology lesson are humans are a symbiote right between a cell and a bacteria the mitochondria are these bacteria that were taken up into our cells a billion years ago or whatever and produce energy for us right they are what allow us to be multicellular organisms that produce massive amounts of energy from fuels like fat and carbohydrates um, and there was a great uh, there's a scientist called Doug Wallace um, who did this great YouTube discussion about chronic diseases and mitochondrial dysfunction, right? And he pointed out that the body's basically, so if you have a um, electrical outage in a city, you will start to see different effects depending on the different types of devices that are 
now gradually getting less and less electricity from the system, right? Certain things will fail immediately, certain things will fail later on, and your incandescent lights will just gradually get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And so what happens in the body is with increasing mitochondrial dysfunction, your mitochondria are able to produce less and less energy, and you start to get increasing levels of dysfunction in various organs. Um, his specific example was looking at mitochondrial DNA defects. Mitochondria have their own little set of DNA and various defects, single defects can produce different diseases based on how fully that defect is expressed in the body. Um, fascinating talk about the effect of mitochondria. So how does one introduce mitochondria, mitochondrial dysfunction into your body? Well, one fine way to do it is by uh, taking cyanide, say, to be a little extreme here, right? If you take cyanide, cyanide causes an immediate cessation of activity in something called the electron transport chain, mm. which is this, you know, tiny structure in the mitochondria. There are, you know, countless mitochondria in your body. There are multiple mitochondria in every single cell in your body, especially in, you know, busy cells like muscle cells or heart cells. And in each one of these mitochondria, there are these tiny little uh, molecular constructs called the electron transport chain, which processes food and converts it into an energy source that your body can actually use to move you around, right? So cyanide is deadly because cyanide stops the electron transport chain from producing energy for you. So you, you know, fall right over dead. Seed oils, as it happens, the fats and seed oils, when they concentrate beyond certain levels that your body is love, is able to manage, start a similar breakdown in the electron transport chain. And at the extreme, this breakdown triggers the cell to die in either an orderly or not orderly fashion. Now, obviously, if you have an organ like the heart, <laughs> which we all like and value and runs continuously throughout our entire lives, and it finds that it is suddenly unable to produce energy and its cells are dying because they're being uh, essentially poisoned by these seed oils, then, you know, you wind up coming down with things like heart attacks and heart failure. And it's basically a failure of that organ to produce enough energy to continue its function. And that can, you know, and, you know, if you eat, if you look at a can of, you know, a bottle of corn oil or something, the fats aren't the problem. The problem is that the fats are easily oxidized and right down they go rancid, right? When they go rancid, they turn into toxins and the toxins are, are what causes the problem. This happens in the processing of these oils. It happens when um, you light. cook with these oils. And most importantly, it happens when you incorporate these fats into the tissues in your body. And that's why we're seeing one cause that's able to create multiple different diseases in your body because these fats are being incorporated into every membrane and every cell in your mm -hmm. entire body. And then they are starting to break down into toxins. Yeah, I think that's important that people realize is when you eat these fats, they become like part of your cell membrane around every cell. Uh, the right. outer layer is going to have some of these fats in, and I don't know if, don't know if we get, we'll get into it a bit later, but that's where the sunburn thing, I think, starts to come into it, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. This is susceptibility to damage. I mean, oxidation is a primary susceptibility, cause of susceptibility, but radiation is another good one, and it doesn't have to be x-rays, you know, uh, ultraviolet or even blue light is sufficient to cause these fats to break down in your body. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's come that becomes important in various retinal diseases, mm -hmm. right? Where you're protected from ultraviolet by your cornea, but the blue light is able to get through. That's one of the things that you see, obviously, but it is causing the back of your eye to break down the fats to break down into toxins. Mm. Yeah. So a lot to dig into here. Um, I think we're kind of. How did we get to this position? Because I've heard you say that 
you believe that the industry knows that these are bad i think the thing you said was there's this uh article of i can't remember the company but there's this thing called plenish which was like a gmo yes. soybean oil and they said right. that their new genetically modified genetically modified soybean oil was less obesogenic than regular soybean oil less obesogenic so that kind of suggests that regular <laughs> soybean oil is causing obesity it's more obesogenic yes exactly isn't that funny um now just to be for the audience to understand the single biggest change in the human diet over the last you know since the beginning of the 20th century is the increase in the consumption of soybean oil and it's largely replaced the fats that we used to eat um i mean if you look at a chart of vegetable oils versus animal oils Animal oils went down over the 20th century. Vegetable oils went up over the 20th century. Our total consumption of fats went up over the 20th century because of this. And um, most of it was soybean oil. Soybean, you know, the soy plant is an easy crop to grow. It's a legume. It's self-fertilizing, right? It puts, farmers put legumes into their crop rotations because they use, uh, because they put nitrogen into the soil. Otherwise they have to buy nitrogen fertilizer to add to the soil. So it's a great product, great, you know, crop to add into your plant, into your rotation. You can sell, you can extract the oil from soybean and, you know, sell it to a soybean oil company. And then you can take the protein that's left over, right? The rest of the soy, soybean, and you can sell it you can use it as an animal feed. You can try and convince people to eat tofu. Tofu traditionally was a fermented food, which reduces a lot of the toxins in these in these uh, seeds, right? Um, as you were saying before, plants don't want us to eat their seeds, so they make them unpalatable. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we have this huge change where we add in this fat and then along comes DuPont and engages this uh, scientist, Frances Sladek, who had already done a study where she looked at soybean oil versus uh, coconut oil. And she found that soybean oil induced obesity and diabetes in mice and the coconut oil didn't. And then they said, oh, here, why don't you take a sample of our plenish genetically modified soybean oil? And she found that, yes, indeed, it was less obesogenic than the regular soybean oil that we're all told is heart healthy and we should eat, um, oops, bit of yes. a problem there. So, but you know, that said, um, industry didn't start convincing us to include these things in our diet because they knew they were going to be bad for us. They did it because they were cheap. Right. And animal production of fats is very difficult and very limited in a lot of ways. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Anthony Gustin, looked into how much, you know, if we were going to replace vegetable oils tomorrow, could we do it from the existing animal fat production? And he found out that, you know, I think by an order of magnitude or two, we cannot because we don't produce enough of it and we couldn't produce enough of it, right? So as the human population went up, we needed energy sources, fat sources included, and when as at the same time they figured out how to produce these vegetable oils and feed them to everybody it was this very convenient way to meet that increased need for energy and you know very cheap easy to produce you know you don't have to deal with a cow's whole lifespan you can just pop seed in the ground and you get a plant at the end you know a couple of weeks or months later so it's inexpensive and only as time went on did they start to discover the problems and unfortunately rather than being forthright about what these problems are the government regulation community and the scientific community has kind of downplayed the problems that we know now they've known for well over 100 years exist with some of these vegetable oils some more than others one of the original ones was cottonseed oil which was produced as a waste product of the cotton industry right they used to have apparently 
massive piles of cotton seeds going rancid in the sun in the American South. And they figured out first how to use them for lamp oil, which is a fine thing to do with them. Then they figured out they could use them for animal feed, but they're toxic. So you can't use too much or your animals will die. And then they figured out that you could start feeding them to humans and they're still toxic. Yeah. One of the side effects is permanent male infertility, which wasn't discovered until Great. the 1990s, I think in China, but they had known, they figured out in 1915, what and how exactly cottonseed um, was toxic to humans and nevertheless continued to sell cottonseed as cooking oil to people throughout mm. the 20th century. Yeah, I heard there's some quote. So, it. so now we're in the position where industry through GMO and breeding technologies, they recognize they can't really admit <laughs> that they have a food that has health problems, right? But for the same reason that these fats cause us health problems, they also cause the companies that use them, incorporate them, in, them into foods problems, and they can use that as a rationale for starting to reduce them in the diet, which is why they are producing things like hyaluronic peanuts, which don't go rancid as fast as regular peanuts. Hyaluronic, so the two fats, well, we'll get to oleic in a minute, what that is. And they're, you know, slowly starting to reduce um, these fats in our food supply because they make foods go bad faster and they cause all sorts of problems if you're using them to cook in the kitchen, for instance. Um, so they're simultaneously, you know, they cause the problem, but they also recognize the problem and they're working to decrease the problem um, in the food supply. And they're generally way ahead of the regulators in recognizing the issue that we have mm, that's interesting because i'm not sure if, are you familiar with minimalist footwear like barefoot shoes that's actually how i got into this whole thing really? believe it or not yeah, through uh i through christopher mcdougall's book born to run which mm. came out in 2009 i saw an ad for it on t on uh the internet and uh, he was wearing the toe shoes that he made famous and he was, I had had a pair of those shoes for about three years at that point. And he was the only other person I'd ever seen wear them. So I immediately went out and bought a copy of his book to find out v v v what he was from up to. Five fingers, I think they're called. Yeah. You got one, that's it. One thing for, uh, each toe. Um, yeah, I, I was speaking. That, to that's you. how I got into the diet thing through that, through a fellow who ran a website called barefoot shoes, sent out a link to this diet blogger who I started reading. He's uh, Stefan Guillenet. He's the one who got me turned on to the whole impact that diet could have on health. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because uh, I spoke to Stephen Sashin, who's the CEO of uh, this company called Zero Shoes, which is another barefoot shoe yeah, company. I, I've known him for ever since back then. Yes, he's achieved great success with Zero. My wife is actually a big fan of their shoes. I haven't tried them yet, but no, I have them and I think they're pretty good. Uh, I was just, the reason I bring him up is because he said to me about the big shoe companies, how they, they've they basically said how, uh, to someone he knows, not like publicly, that the barefoot kind of natural movement thing works, but they can't change their shoes and say it works because that means they've also have been lying for 50 years or whatever. So it sounds like a well, that's. Thing. He's not quite right there. Uh, they do actually say oh, public, that yeah. they work. Huh? No, but I think he, sa he said that what he's doing is they know that certain features of modern shoes aren't good, but they continue to produce them. Oh, yeah. No, they've. Uh, there was a paper, and I can't remember the author's name, or I'd look it up right now, but um, there's a paper that came out Boy, must have been the early, late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and in the paper, they looked, they compared barefoot Indians to shod Indians to shod Westerners. And one of the conclusions of that paper was that shoes cause our foot, feet to become deformed. And that's the word they use. And that a lot of the foot issues were um, due to these deformities that are induced by shoes. And that paper was heralded 
and Nike gave them a huge award as the best shoe research, shoe slash footwear research of the year. So, <laughs> and that, that's why Nike came out with the Nike Free, right? Which isn't what you or I would call a minimalist shoe, but by their standards it is. And that was the whole argument for benefit of it was that it allowed your foot to work more naturally and not to be so constrained by the shoe. So they've, you know, they, you know, they've admitted it, right? Um, I've done an enormous amount of research in that area as well before I get into the whole diet thing. So we could, we could go on and on and on about that. I actually know Chris McDougall now personally and, uh, helped uh, Dan Lieberman in some small way, the scientist who was quoted in Born to Run uh, with one of his books on actually diet and human health back in 2011. So that's yeah, that's a very similar story, right? I mean, in shoes, it's more vanity. Um, shoes certainly have a layer level of protective function, no question, but they we've taken it beyond it. And again, similarly to how we knew about the problems with vegetable oils, you know, we knew there was a doctor who wrote a book for the US Army back in 1911. Um, he was a brigadier general in the army and the leading physician in the country. And he wrote a book about how bad, you know, shoes could be for your feet and how this was why the army had so much problem on marches with 30% dropout rates and he created a minimalist shoe, the GI boot, right? That they won World War One and World War Two in. And, you know, he found that he could take the injury rate on marches from 30% to zero. Wow, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I brought that up because that's uh, interesting how you know all about that as well. I just thought it was an interesting parallel with these two industries, how, what is- It's a perfect parallel commonly portrayed as perhaps not the actual best uh thing for humans yeah yeah it's a per it's a perfect parallel and that's how i when i fired, started learning about the diet stuff i was like oh wow this is exactly like you know i had, had my eyes open doing the shoe research and realizing that we'd known all about it ever since 1911 and yet they produced millions and millions of these shoes and you know, most American men at one point wore them. And then we just, you know, through bad practices in primarily academia and also the shoe industry, we forgot all about it. And now the biggest injury issue in the US Army is running injuries, which are caused by shoes and also by poor diet causing obesity. Um, and so yeah, choice. it's a pretty perfect parallel. Hmm. Yeah, another thing I wanted to bring up was I think a part of the reason that these oils are in so many foods um, still, even though there's some evidence that they're not good, is through the endocannabinoid system and how these fats can actually make you uh, mess with your society mechanisms and encourage you to overeat. Right, right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is... Harvard University a few years back did a study where they looked at various different foods and they were trying to figure out which foods actually induce obesity and what they found. And I would call this research fraud. Um, what they found quite clearly was that potatoes cooked in seed oils are the most obesogenic food by far, like five to seven times as much as anything else. Um, but potatoes that are cooked in other fats, like mashed potatoes, which are made with butter, or potatoes with no fats at all, like boiled potatoes, are not obesogenic at all. And then they turned around and they blamed it on the carbohydrate content in the potatoes. Now, any idiot, except apparently for a Harvard Nutrition PhD, can tell you that if you add fat to a potato, you are not increasing the carbohydrate content of the potato. You are increasing the fat content. That's what adding means right so they turned around and said oh well it's because the carbohydrate content's going up and you know okay so why does this happen right why are these fats so fat 
uh, so fattening? Well, the answer is that they're bioactive. Okay, this is why we need to consume polyunsaturated fats, which are the class of fats that we're talking about here, the fats that are most susceptible to going rancid. Um, they are used in the body for various functions, right? You need omega-3 fats for your brain development. You need a certain amount of omega-6 fats, the fats that are typically found in seed oils for your brain development and for your immune system and various other functions in the body, right? We need these things. They're a natural part of our environment and our diet. Um, Some. That's the key part. Some, right. So let's say that you, so when you consume seed oils, when you consume a seed oil, say a French fry, right? You body, you have fat detectors in your tongue and it detects that you're eating certain different types of fat. It actually takes a tiny sample of the fat and says, ooh, look, we're getting this type of fat and that type of fat. Now your body is a survival machine, right? So fats your primary energy source and your primary the primary means by which your body stores energy right that's why if you look at a you know if you look at where calories are stored in your body it's like 95 to 99 percent of them are stored in fat and five to one percent are stored in carbohydrates in the form of glycogen right um so your body detects these fats. It says, yay, we found a fat source. Let's get hungry and eat a lot of it, right? And researchers have gone and looked at various different types of fats, and they figured out that there are two fats that cause this reaction of hyperphagia, right? Hyperphagia is overeating. It's hunger, right? Simple, simple. you taste it, tastes good, it's got fats. Your brain kicks into, you know, We've got a fat source here, let's eat. Um, problem is one of those fats also contains a satiety signal, right? The other fat breaks the satiety signal and causes it not to happen. So it makes you just eat and eat and eat, right? The positive fat there, the one that makes you eat and then makes you stop eating is the, is the fat that's generally found in animal fats and uh, fruit oils. Um, I mentioned oleic acid before. This is a monounsaturated fat. And that's the fat that causes both the eating response and the satiation response. It produces a chemical in your gut called OEA, which basically tells your body, stop eating. We've had enough, right? The other fat is linoleic acid. This is the fat that's in seed oils. This causes you to eat, but it also impairs through mechanisms I don't think we understand yet the production of the off signal, right? So you eat, you get hungry, and you never get this signal to stop eating. So hyperphagia. Um, it also, once it gets into your body, turns into another chemical. So those chemicals, the ones that cause you to eat are called endocannabinoids, right? And this is a very well described process in the scientific literature. You can take a rat and inject one of these chemicals. You can feed them until they don't want to eat anymore. You can inject one of these chemicals into their brain and they will start eating again, right? Um, there's another chemical that they use in these experiments and it's the THC from marijuana, which are cannabis plant, hence the term cannabinoid for the chemicals that come in marijuana and the ones that are produced inside your body are called the endocannabinoids, endo meaning inside, right? So marijuana causes the munchies, right? It's a well-known effect. Um, so I hear, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> and when people get the, mu the munchies, what do they crave? They crave junk food. They crave chips or candy or, you know, they don't crave steak. Um, so, you know, when you consume these fats, they are converted, the omega-6 fats in your gut are converted into these endocannabinoids, right? And either because you're eating a lot of them or the other reason is because you're hungry, right? So this is what your body make. this is how your body makes you hungry. It turns omega-6 fats in your gut, which are always supposed to be there in some quantity, into this chemical that makes you eat, okay? Um, and then another chemical comes along, which is not technically an endocannabinoid, but it's very similar. And it says, okay, you've eaten enough, stop eating. 
turn off the off signal, obviously you're going to have a problem. Um, the effect is so well known that THC is actually marketed as an FDA approved drug called dronabinil, and it is sold to make humans who have uh, cancer cachexia, right, which is the wasting that people experience when they're eating or in, um, what you might call it, uh, HIV. Um, people with AIDS don't want to eat, so they give them this drug and it makes them want to eat. Um, so there's your, you know, <laughs> there's your mechanism for why we eat so much. We have a human drug, or we did, called Ramonavant, mm. which blocks this effect, right? It's an endocannabinoid um, receptor inhibitor, so it disables your ability to take up these chemicals and get this obesogenic effect. Unfortunately, these are very important chemicals in your body, right? They don't just make you want to eat. They have all sorts of mood and reward effects. And one of the things that they make people want to do when people eat them is to commit suicide. So they were taken off the market in error, in my opinion. And we can, that's kind of a huge topic, but you know, these drugs should be available for people with obesity, because the only other option that these people have at this point, with the exception of recent drugs that have come out like WeGovy, the primary option offered by the medical society is to basically do a lobotomy and sever the nerve connections between the brain and the gut that traffic in these endocannabinoids. And the suicide rate for people who have that surgery is far, far higher than it was for the people who got that drug. So the drug was clearly the better of the two options. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, medicine being a very problematic industry, they took the safer option off the market and left people with this horrible disfiguring surgery. Mm. Well, we could just... That's a little tangent there, but anyway. <laughs> Tell them just but that's how, well no that's how well known this mechanism is, right? I mean, they know that this is why bariatric surgery is successful when it's successful, because mm. it's not always successful, is because you're affecting this endocannabinoid cannabinoid pathway between your mouth, your brain, and your gut that tells you you should eat. Um, yeah, I think that's why if you look on like processed food packets, vegetables, and like literally all of them, and I think it's to try and get people to keep buying the products. Um, I Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and it's funny, because I've heard I experienced this myself. And I've had lots of other people tell me the same thing. If you make French fries from a fat that's low in omega six, fats like beef tallow, which is what McDonald's used to use before the vegans got a hold of them. <laughs> you know, you only eat a little bit of it and then you are full. They're incredibly satiating. If you switch out the fats and use this, use seed oils that lack the satiety signal, you know, I mean, McDonald's used to sell these teeny little envelopes of French fries to go with your hamburger. Now they sell buckets of French fries to go with your hamburger. And we now know that a French fry fr fried in seed oil, thanks to the nutritionists at Harvard University, is the single most fattening food in our diet. Gee, what a shock. Wow, yeah. Uh, I, I made a video about seed oils a little bit ago and from everything I'd learned and there were, there were people commenting saying, oh yeah, my mum used to make like cookies with butter and i used to only eat like a few but then once the seed oils they used to just eat loads and i think yeah. it's quite a good counter to a common kind of a lot of people who defend seed oils will say oh well we've also increased calories a ton since um previous before these diseases but then I, i'm think i'm sitting there thinking well why have we increased calories so much we don't just what we just suddenly decide to start stuffing ourselves like Exactly. I think this pathway shows how I'm, I'm sure excess calories are definitely contributing to the issues as well. But that pathway, the seed oils making people more hungry, eating too much, leading to more. Problems. Well, it's, a, it's actually a double edged sword, right? Because not only do they, I mean, everybody's heard of calories in calories out, right? Gary Taubes has done a lot of great critiques of using that as a um, explanation. Right. It's a description. It's not an explanation. The fact that you are eating more food and 
burning off less energy is a requirement for gaining weight at some level. There's a term called feed efficiency, right? Which is that different foods will cause you to gain different amounts of weight, right? All calories are not equal, but that feed efficiency effect is actually fairly small. Um, however, when you're, so this drug that I mentioned, Ramonavan, um, when you give an animal or a human Ramonavan, they don't actually consume much less calories. There is an initial re reduction in calorie content most of the weight loss, and the same thing is true after bariatric surgery, most of the weight loss is caused by an increase in your body's energy expenditure, right? So what the endocannabinoids are doing is actually causing your body to burn less energy. And taking these drugs causes your body to start burning more energy. And that's one, that's one of the reasons why you're losing weight. Now, if you couple that with reducing you know, you've basically at that point turned off the hyperphagia signal because you're blocking the chemical from being taken up by your body. And that chemical is what is causing you both to eat, it's put, basically putting your body into energy storage mode, which is again, we're survival machines, right? Gathering and storing energy is what we have to do to survive. So it's a pro-survival trait that we have massively that we've overwhelmed with a massive increase in one of the signals that would normally cause us to engage in a healthy pro survival behavior. Yeah. Um, Cause now what's even, what's even a little worse is that when these fats get into your body and they oxidize, as I mentioned, they turn into various different chemicals. And one of the chemicals, uh, hydroxynonanol is a known obesogen. So in, any organism, if you inject this chemical into it or feed it enough to produce this chemical, it will actually alter the body's fat storage system to produce more fat, right? So if you give it to a cell, it will cause the cell to start producing and storing more fat. If you give it to a roundworm, right? The C. elegans, the classic organism used to study metabolic issues in the laboratory, it will cause them to become fat. And it has the same effect in lab, lab rats and apparently the same effect in humans because obese humans have high levels of this chemical in their fat cells and in all around their body. Now, it not only causes your body to start producing and storing more fat, it's unfortunately highly toxic and causes whole raft of other issues, which is why it's implicated in every single one of the chronic diseases. Mm. So you've got kind of a triple whammy here, right? It makes you eat more, it makes you, you uh, expend less energy, and it makes you store more fat. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an important point that getting fat is actually a feature and not a bug. And to a degree, yes, yeah, to, to a degree, yes. So how this would have usually happened, from what we understand, is that during like the autumn or the fall, if you're in America, uh, coming into winter, humans would probably be eating more nuts uh, and like less. Well, that is that, is that right or not? That, that doesn't really work in practice. It's a pretty good theory, but in practice, okay. There are there's only one primate that actually. Humans are primates, right? We're part of this group of animals that has tends to climb around in trees that so we have very active hands. There's only one prime, you know, monkeys, apes, lemurs. So there's only one primate that actually hibernates and it's a lemur, right? Mm. And as I had said, the problem with these fats is that they're, they don't store well, okay? They're very susceptible to oxidation and going rancid. And when that happens, they're toxic. So. Let's say you're a little lemur and you live in the tropics and you hibernate part of the year because it's the dry season. There's no change in temperature, right? You live in a hot place, no change in temperature around the year. But every part of the year, there's a dry season and your food supply goes away. So you hibernate to get through that period, right? Now, lemurs change their diet when they're going preparing for the rainy season and hibernation and they do it by eating fewer omega-6 fats because if you're in a warm climate and you're storing them for months they're going to go rancid 
And if your only source of fat is the stored fat in your body, you don't want it to be going rancid on you, right? That's going to cause all the sorts of problems that we're seeing in humans who eat a lot of these seed oils. So primates that hibernate, a V1 primate that hibernates doesn't actually rely on this as a hibernation signal. Mm. It has another signal i don't know what it is but it's not the fats that it eat and it causes it among other things to put on weight but also to reduce the amount of omega-6 fats that it's eating there's a bat that hibernates for the same reason in the tropics and it does the same thing it reduces its consumption of omega-6 fats prior to hibernation now if you're say living in the arctic and your or temperate areas and your hibernation pattern is going to be during a period of extreme cold then consuming more polyunsaturated fats is okay because you know you're in a cold environment and you're not going to be as susceptible to those fats going rancid while you're trying to make it through the food um the period of food deprivation right it's important to understand in that model that torpor and hibernation are caused by food shortage not by temperature right animals use temperature as a signal of incipient food shortage but there are lots of animals, including rodents and, you know, polar bears who don't actually hibernate in the cold. They continue to hunt and eat all, all winter long. And here in Idaho, there are, um, you know, we're in the high desert, but we have a lot of high mountains and they get a ton of snow every year. And when in the spring, when you go out, you see all of these little tunnels along the surface of the soil where the snow soil interface was because the ground squirrels that we have around here don't hibernate. They're active all winter long, even though they're literally digging tunnels under the snow to find their food sources underground. So, you know, they're not, these fats aren't a hibernation signal. It's a correlation that has confused some people into thinking they're causing hibernation. They do cause a decline in energy expenditure. Um, mm. So I suppose they could be useful to, you know, the animals that are to, using them as kind of a energy as a energy storage signal but they're not the only energy storage signal that they're using right okay. the animals that depend on these fat these polyunsaturated fats for storage actually do better with less seed oils and more of the healthier omega-3 fats in their diet yeah thanks for pulling me up on that tucker because i had heard that the, well, the idea was that they eat more omega-6 and then they're going to put on more weight burn less energy so they're going to fatten up and be able to survive but it sounds it's, like maybe in it's cold a good, environments it's a good story and it's definitely pointing us at a truth but it's not the whole explanation mm, yeah okay so next i want to talk about like monogastric animals so mainly like pigs and poultry and, and humans, yeah. Um, when they eat polyunsaturated fats, they store them right in the tissues. Unlike ruminants, so like cows, goats, sheep, will be able to convert these fats into saturated fats or other fats. I'm not sure. Um, right. This this can still cause problems, right? Can you talk more about that? Yeah. So um, ruminants, monogast. The term you used means one stomach. Um, cows, famously, we all learned in you know elementary school, have four stomachs. We only have one stomach, right? One of their stomachs is called the rumen, and hence the term ruminants. And the rumen is this interesting organ. Cows don't actually eat grass, right? Cows eat bacteria, and they feed the grass to the bacteria, and the bacteria bacteria and yeasts and other things living in their rumens ferment the grass, the carbohydrate that, you know, mammals can't break down the carbohydrates in grass, but bacteria can. So the cows have this little pocket of bacteria that they carry around to convert indigestible grass into fats and proteins. So a cow is actually on a high fat, high protein diet because it is eating the things in its gut that are producing fat and protein from, carbohydrate, from carbohydrate, right? Um, in the process of doing that, the 
uh, bacteria in its gut can convert fats, right? So if you start feeding, I mean, if you, if you start, you know, if you want to fatten up cows, cows will get fat on a healthy cow diet because it's natural to put on fat as we were discussing. If you want them to get fat past that point, past the healthy point, you start feeding them grains, right? And the high carbohydrate load and probably the high um, seed oil load in a grain, right? A grain is a seed, obviously, and causes them to produce more fat than you want them to. But the rumen protects them to some extent because it converts the omega-6 fats into either beneficial omega-6 fats, like one is called conjugated linoleic acid, um, but it also can convert it into other fats. So if you give a cow or a pig a similar diet, the pig will just take up the omega-6 fats and store them in its body. The cow will wind up with a far lower level of omega-6 fats in its in its body because it's converting some of them into other fats. So in some to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent, they are protected. Now, my physician, who is a guy who um, here in Idaho, it's a very agricultural environment, and he was able to change his diet and lose weight by listening to my stuff here on the internet. And he explains this to a lot of his patients very simply. He, you know, they're dairy farmers and, you know, I live in an area, Idaho is famous for potatoes, but it's actually a huge dairy state and a huge beef producing state, much to my surprise. If you drive around Idaho, you see a lot more cows than you do potato fields. Um, so he, he says, if you want to fatten up an animal, what do you feed them? And they're like, oh, we feed them grains and seed oils. <laughs> and then they say, oh, yeah, you're right. And, the, and then he says, so guess what happens if you eat fewer grains and seed oils? And they say, I'll lose weight. Bingo. <laughs> right? So this isn't rocket scientists. Literally, every farmer knows this. Um, so anyway. Ruminants are protected from that process. Monogasts are not. Monogasts don't have rumen. They, we are designed to preferentially absorb fat, right? When you eat, when you eat, food goes into your stomach and then into your small intestine. And in your small intestine, food is segregated into two things, fat and everything else. It's not 100% accurate because there are some gradations of fats, but it's fat and everything else. Fat goes into um, what's called a chylomicron, which is a little delivery package, much like an LDL that you mentioned earlier. And this is sent into your lymph system, right? Not your bloodstream. And it is distributed up into a portal into your bloodstream. And these fat-filled chylomicrons are sent out into your body, right? Everything else that you eat goes into the bloodstream something called the portal vein, which takes it up to the liver where it can be detoxified, right? So everything else gets sent to the liver, which is this giant filter and sort of chemical engine that processes toxins to make things more edible for you, except for fat. Fat is preferred and gets this high speed access to the rest of your body. Obviously, if we start consuming levels of a fat that is can become rancid and toxic in our body that's a that system's a problem but that's how it works so your body you know the levels of fat in your body if you're a monogast pretty much reflect what you're eating right so if you're eating a high omega-6 diet you're going to have high levels of omega-6 in your tissues and in your fat cells and if you aren't you won't um in and that concentrates right so if you, they did a wonderful experiment, you know, farm-raised salmon, they feed soybean oil to some extent um, and soy because it's cheap. It's a cheap source of protein, much easier to get a hold of than fish meal, which is very expensive. And if you do that, you make the salmon fat, right? Because they have more omega-6 fats in their body now. And if you grind up those salmon and you feed them to mice, the mice get fat because the important variable there is the level of omega-6 fats that they're consuming, right? So the same thing happens in humans. The largest source of omega-6 fats from seed oils in the American diet is shockingly chicken. It's not seed oils, 
Why is that? Because they feed chickens lots of grains and seed oils to fatten them up as fast as they can. And they are monogasts and they concentrate those fats and then we turn around and eat them and, you know, we concentrate those fats too. So if you graph over the 20th century, as uh, Stefan Guiné and another scientist did, the, you know, if you sample adipose tissue over the 20th century, what you see is a steady increase in the levels of omega-6 fats in our adipose tissue as mirrored, mirroring the steady increase in omega-6 fats that we consumed over the course of the 20th century. Yeah. So. Okay, I was just wondering. So I heard that they are, obviously we are storing these. Is it as bad as seed oils? It's the same chemical, it's no different. Mm. I mean, the only thing that seems to matter is the quantity, not the source. Um, in a seed, because seeds aren't using these fats because they don't want us to eat them. Seeds are using these fats because they need them themselves, right? Mm. So in a seed, the seeds are packaged with antioxidants, typically vitamin E, tocopherols, mm. right? There's a variety of tocopherols. Uh, yeah. Vitamin E is the one that we use, um, alpha tocopherol. And that protects the seeds from the seed oils in them from going rancid, which is why you can store a seed for a hundred years and it will still be good to go at the end of that period, right? Because the fats haven't gotten rancid because they're protected. Uh, the problem is when we eat these fats, we segregate them from the antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And in our bodies, these antioxidants actually become pro-oxidants, right? This is a common feature of a lot of antioxidants that they have this dual nature where, where they can be protective against oxidation or they can promote oxidation. So, for instance, vitamin C is an antioxidant, right? But the standard method to induce these fats to go rancid in an organism is to take vitamin C in conjunction with iron, which becomes a pro oxidation stimulus and causes the fats in the organism's body to go rancid more quickly. So, you know, the antioxidants that we get in seed oils may help the seed oils from going rancid while they're sitting on the shelf, but they don't protect them at all when they're being cooked and they don't protect them at all when they're in your body. And in fact, to the contrary, the human experiments that we've done have shown that increased levels of these antioxidants actually cause, this has been done specifically in, uh, trying to protect against heart disease, um, they cause more, they cause worse oxidation and higher levels of heart disease, worse outcomes in heart disease. Wow. So another one of these good ideas, biology is complicated. This is why we have to do tests of things because the simple idea of, you know, if oxidation is the problem from these vegetable fats, the vegetable fats come packaged with an antioxidant, let's give it to people and it'll protect them from the oxidation, but it actually makes the oxidation worse in the body. This is why we do tests. Yeah, it's a good idea. That's quite concerning because a lot of people are taking like, I guess, quite high doses of vitamin C, like supplements and stuff. Yeah, I don't know exactly what the effect of vitamins, vitamin, I'm speaking like an Englishman now, I'll say vitamin because I'm two countries divided by a common language, right? Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, I don't know that vitamin C in the body has a negative effect per lipid peroxidation, um, absent iron. iron, absent the iron intake. Um, we know that iron alone consumed in conjunction with seed oils is a really bad idea. Um, I don't know particularly so gee, let's think, let's think for a moment. Is there any circumstance under which we would eat a lot of iron and a lot of vegetable oils? Oh, when you go to McDonald's and you get a hamburger and a side of fries. So you are taking a easily oxidized fat and a catalyst that causes the oxidation of that fat. Oh, yeah. right? oh, a catalyst, yeah. Which is why every i'm searching for a word here the ones that come to mind are not at all kind every food scientist or nutritionist 
who tells you that fast food is bad for you and shows you a picture of a hamburger. The healthiest thing in a fat food meal, without question, is the high iron beef patty, right? And if all you eat from that meal, and people have done this experiment on themselves, if the only thing you eat from that meal is the beef patty, you'll do great. You'll be totally healthy. There's a wonderful movie called um, Fathead done by a guy, made by a guy named Tom Naughton who did exactly that experiment with himself. And he lost weight, his LDL got better, he felt great, right? He would go to McDonald's and just eat patties. Um, I think he just ate the burgers, actually. Don't blame, I, uh, this yeah. a, don't blame the And why or... is that? It's because you are avoiding the toxic component of the meal, the two toxic components, right? The excess sugar can be a toxin and the seed oils are clearly a toxin. And you're avoiding the catalyst that makes them worse. So they've done lots of experiments looking spe specifically at colon cancer in animals. And what they find is that they're blaming, they started out by blaming the iron in the fat, in the meat. And what they discovered was that the iron oxidizes the omega-6 fats in your gut, turning them into these toxins that I've been talking about. And if all you have is the iron, there's no negative effect, right? The oxidized omega-6 fats are required in this model of inducing colon cancer in animals. Mm. It's not, you know, the problem is not the fast food. The problem is the seed oils in the fast food. If we went back to the old McDonald's model of cooking the fats in, uh, yeah. cooking the fries in tallow, I think it is fair to say, fairly safe to say that a McDonald's meal would be a health food. Wow. Yeah, there's, there's a saying among like people in like the keto and like the carnivore community like don't blame the burger the meat for what the like the fries and the soda did exactly and that's exactly right yeah. and that's you know back to ensure you know i discussed this food that is prescribed by physicians all over the world to cause people to put on weight right what are the active ingredients in that it's seed oils typically corn oil and sugar right and in animal models, seed oil, sugar causes obesity. Boom. There's your recipe, right? We know it. I mean, it's such a, it's, it's such a reliable means of inducing obesity that we can do it in animals and people, and we've known it for decades, right? So why can't our food science profession figure this out? They do it in their labs every day, and hospitals do it every day. Oh, you poor old lady, you know, you're, you're here in the hospital and you're losing weight. Here's a bottle of insure. It'll fatten you up. Mm. Yeah. I've been really enjoying this so far. I'm learning a lot, Tucker. Uh, I want to respect your time. It's been about an hour. You, you could keep going or you got to go. Yeah, we can keep going for a little bit. I mean, I think we should get into the whole LDL conversation. Yes. Yeah. That's something I've got down here because I've heard you say, I think it was your LDL last time you mentioned it was like 250. Uh, uh, something like that, yeah. And I mean, I don't really worry about it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to get into because I think the recommended range is like under 100. Um, I know, my 250 probably would have been my total cholesterol. Um, oh, okay. I don't remember. Honestly, I literally don't remember. I posted it to Twitter. But I'm not going to bother to look it up. It was high. It would cause a cardiologist to turn white. Um, yeah. Regardless of his r racial background, he'd be like, oh, oh my God, you're going to kill over from a heart attack tomorrow. Stop throwing statins at you. Yeah, um, exactly. So let's talk about heart disease. Yeah, from, from what I've seen and read from your stuff and other stuff, that LDL inherently isn't bad. But LDL with these omega sixes is, is almost ferrying the pro the oxidation products around or whatever the the, the right. omega sixes. So well, let's just a little bit of background to understand what's going on here, right? I mentioned chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are a protein called an ApoB for short, apolipoprotein B, right? That is produced in your intestine, right? 
we all know that fats and oils or oil and water doesn't mix, right? Um, you need something in your body if you want to move fat around, which we have to to survive. You need to package it up inside something that will get through the water and the water in your blood and also be like an envelope if you want to think of it this way so that cells know what's going by oh this thing that bumped into me is lunch right and they do it by packaging it up in uh this protein called apob and we have two kinds of apob proteins and this is the dumbest bit of nomenclature nomenclature i've ever come across in medical lit literature we have an apob 100 and we have an apob 48 okay so what's the ApoB 100? Well, it's the entire ApoB molecule, okay? And this is produced in the liver and it's sent out in, it's sent out and ultimately becomes these things called LDL, right? Then we have this other ApoB, which is ApoB 48. What's that? ApoB 48% of the ApoB 100. It's not the entire molecule, it's a part of the molecule. Right, so that's the difference between ApoB 100 and ApoB 48. It's the silliest thing I've ever heard of, but it's accurate, fine, and it allows us to distinguish between the two types of molecules, which is useful because most of the ApoB 48, almost all of it, is produced in your gut in these chylomicrons, right? And they are made in various different sizes of chylomicrons from this huge packages of fat that are actually visible under a microscope and change the color of your blood if you eat a really fatty meal to these little particles that are not much bigger than a regular LDL that are sent around and deliver fat to your entire body, right? Any cell in your body can grab up fat that's going by and they all do because they all need it uh, for fuel. Um, and to build your body, a lot of the membranes in your body including the membrane around a chylomicon or an LDL is made up of protein and fat. Um, so two ways your body distributes fat around, one of them is chylomicrons from the gut and the other is LDL particles from your liver and from some cells, right? And then we have this other thing called HDL, which we're not gonna get into at the moment. HDL is basically, LDLs are the way to send fat out, HDL, fat and cholesterol. HDL is the way to bring cholesterol and fat back into the liver if the cell has too much of it, for instance. Um, so LDL goes out, 99, 90% of the LDL in your body is produced by the liver as what's known as very low density lipoprotein. LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. And they are packages of cholesterol and lots of fat. And cells will grab one of these envelopes going by and take the fat out of it and some of the cholesterol and then it becomes what's left over which is an ldl and the ldl can be taken up by another cell or it can go back to the liver and the liver will take it up and then repackage it and send it back out again and this happens dave feldman who's an expert on this process once yeah. said to me that there are literally quadrillions of these VLDL, LDL packages being produced every day in your body, right? So you've got an enormous number of them. And it's obviously a fundamental part of your metabolism because if you can't package fats and send them out and can't package up cholesterol and send them out, you will start to suffer negative effects, um, including death. Um, having deficits of these proteins can be, you know, these APOBs can be a problem in health. Um, so anyway, they're a perfectly normal part of your metabolism. We have populations, and it's important to note, some physicians will tell you that ApoB is what causes heart disease. We have populations in the world who don't have heart disease, right? One of those populations used to be the United States. Another one of those populations used to be the United Kingdom, where we had extremely low rates of heart disease back in the 1800s, and then through the course of the 20th century, rates of heart disease went up. Um, Paul White is an American physician who is considered the far father of the practice of cardiology here in the United States. He was one of the founders of the American Heart Association. And he talked about how when he was going through medical school, 
having a heart attack was virtually unheard of. And it wasn't because they didn't know what they were, as some physicians claim. Physicians, medicine is a funny business. It's the only industry I'm aware of where one of their basic precepts is that the people had to do, who taught us how to do this were all incompetent, mm. <laughs> right? So cardiologists will tell you, oh, well, they just didn't know how to do cardiology. And that's why they didn't know that everybody was dropping like flies from heart disease all around them. Well, they did. And they knew what it looked like. And there were rare circumstances where it could happen. And they were aware of that. And they even kept statistics on how, I, how often it was happening. So we know that places like the United States, the United Kingdom, and every other country in the world that had low rates of, card, of heart disease. Well, and nowadays, are. you can go... Sorry, do you have a question? I was just going to say that was when they were eating less seed oils and more animal fats. Oh, you're jumping ahead now. Not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> Keep going. So cardiologists love to point out this population in South America um, called the Chimene, who live in the Amazonian jungle in Bolivia and are the poster child for cardiologists because... Supposedly, they have low LDL and they have virtually non-existent rates of heart disease. They're not the only such population, but they're the popular one recently, right? So we know that their heart disease, we know that uh, I heard, I listened to a podcast the other day by Peter Atia where he said, we are doomed to, car to heart disease because of the nature of ApoB. Well, that's just not true because a population like the Chimene has similar or higher levels of ApoB to what Americans have and no heart disease, mm -hmm. right? So ApoB does not cause heart disease. An LDL particle is an ApoB particle, right? A type of ApoB particle. Therefore, LDL does not per se cause heart disease, right? And we know that because back in the 1970s, these scientists came up with the idea. They discovered Brown and Goldstein. They discovered the LDL receptor. They got a Nobel Prize for that discovery. And they said, okay, we know what's going on here. The first step of atherosclerosis is the creation of these things called foam cells. A foam cell is a type of white blood cell that becomes engorged with fat and cholesterol. And they are seen in atherosclerotic plaques. And it's thought that that's how all the fat and cholesterol gets into the atherosclerotic plaque. The plaque is the thing that kills you, right? It's like this sticking on the wall. cyst on the side of your uh, artery and it kills you. It's thought by bursting and then spraying stuff all throughout your body and blocking blood flow to your heart and causing a heart attack, right? Um, and these cysts, these plaques are full of foam cells. One of the things they're full of is foam cells. So the first step of atherosclerosis leading to a heart attack is thought to be the creation of these foam cells. So what did these scientists do? They took um, a bunch of LDL and a bunch of white blood cells and they put them in a vial together and they said, wow, foam cells. But it didn't work, mm -hmm. which is again, why we do tests, right? And what they discovered was that you have to modify the LDL the modified LDL will cause the white blood cells, the monocytes, to become foam cells, right? But the modification that they used isn't one that actually happens in the body. It's called acetylation. So another couple of doctor scientists, uh, Steinberg and Whitstam, figured out what the nature of the modification is that actually happens in the body. And it is the oxidation of the polyunsaturated omega-6 fats in the LDL, right? Mm. LDL, as I mentioned, is a fat delivery mechanism. It's packaged up, you know, it's got a membrane around it, which is made of fats, including omega-6 fats. And it's got a payload of fats, which is triglycerides and cholesterol esters, which is cholesterol bound to a single fat molecule. And if you're eating a Western diet, the primary content of that LDL is going to be a lot of omega-6 fats, right? And if these fats become oxidized, then all of a sudden the white blood cells are interested in hoovering up as much of them as they can. And that's what causes them to become foam cells. Mm -hmm. So this predisposition to oxidation of LDL, they discovered back in the 1980s, was a result of 
the diet, okay? If you took ra rabbits, they used first, and then people, they used second in a number of experiments. Um, and you gave them lots of olive oil, which is high in oleic acid, which is not susceptible to oxidation like a polyunsaturated fat is, then their LDL would not oxidize easily and they would not cause foam cell production, right? But if you gave them vegetable oils, seed oils, which are full of these omega-6 fats, it would change the composition of the LDL molecule. And then you could easily oxidize the LDL and it would kick off this process of atherosclerosis. So we've known since the 1980s that a native LDL particle or an unoxidized LDL particle is not what's causing atherosclerosis, that it's only the LDL particles that are comprised of oxidized omega-6 fats that kick this process off, mm. right? So why am I not worried about my LDL being high and my cholesterol being high? Because so. cholesterol is neutral. That's why the body uses it, right? It's part of the cell membranes. Fats, most fats like saturated fats or monounsaturated fats like oleic acid are neutral, okay? That's why the body uses them. You can come up with rather ridiculous circumstances in a laboratory where these things are a problem, but in your actual body, right, what we care about, they are used because they are neutral and they are pro-survival, right? Stable. Stable, right? If you bind them to, if you bind cholesterol to omega-6 fats or you package up a lot of omega-6 fats through a variety of mechanisms, they can become oxidized and the omega-6 fat attached to the cholesterol oxidizes the cholesterol and causes the cholesterol to become toxic. But native cholesterol is not a problem, only oxidized cholesterol, just like fats are not a problem, only oxidized fats, right? So if I'm eating a diet that looks like the Chimane, where well, I don't want to jump ahead there. We're trying not to jump ahead, right, in this story. You can jump if I'm eating a diet that looks like the Chimene or like an American in the 1800s or like an Englishman in the 1800s, then I'm not worried about my APOB or my LDL because I'm lacking the ingredient that causes it to become pathogenic, the omega-6 fats. And sure enough, when we go look at the Chimene, the, they live in the Amazon jungle for the most part part, they don't get seed oils in their diet, right? Unfortunately, they're starting to get seed oils. And the scientists down there did an analysis. Oh, no, why are the Chimene starting to become obese? Oh, look, they're eating more vegetable oils. Whoops. And they're probably going to start coming down with heart disease because we know that's the mechanism for it, right? Now people will say, oh, this is too simple, Tucker. This isn't, this is you know, there are lots of causes of heart disease. You know, there's smoking, there's pollution, all those mechanisms, there's, you know, infection, all of those mechanisms depend on oxidizing the omega-6 fats in the LDL that and in your spark. body. I heard someone say, if you eat a bunch of omega-6, you're kind of like filling yourself with firewood. And then if you smoke, that's almost like the spark and you just set off all of this tinder. Right. Well, smoke, smoking actually contains some of the same fats that are toxins produced by omega-6 fats, like aquiline, right? Mm. And these chemicals are, these molecules are toxic because they react with other molecules and alter their behavior, right? And one of the things that they can do is cause other molecules to oxidize. And then, you know, you wind up with this thing that's been well described in the literature where an omega-6 fat becomes oxidized, breaks down into these chemicals, and those chemicals can then oxidize the adjacent omega-6 fat, right? That's why we have these antioxidants in our body like glutathione, because they break this process. Peroxidation you, cascade, right? It's an oxidation cascade, it's a death spiral. If you do it in a test tube where you don't have the antioxidants, you will find that all of the omega-6 fats are broken down into these toxins until there's nothing left. Right. So it's a self-sustaining process or can be right. That's why we have antioxidants in the body. If you glutathione is the main antioxidant of for omega-6 fats, 
if you have a genetic defect where you don't have glutathione, you will never be born. That's how important it is. You can't survive without it. Um, and there's another one called ALDH, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is less important than glutathione. People are born with an inactive form of that. And guess what? They're more susceptible to heart disease and all the other aspects of the uh, chronic diseases. So this is, as it happens, one of the most common human mutations. 50% of the people in China and Japan about have that particular mutation. So it's incredibly well studied. And they're starting to realize that, hey, if we, you know, if, if if we take, if we turn that up, that protection up against oxidized omega-6 fats, you're less susceptible to all of these diseases. Mm, yeah. Including obesity, by the way. That was something I was going to ask you, because when you speak to Ken Berry, um, Dr. Ken Berry, you were saying how yep. the, 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 Ch the Chinese, Japanese, and other Asians as well, I think, uh, uh, populations, they eat a lot of rice, and rice was high in omega-6, and that was causing... Uh, them to be more susceptible to these diseases. Do we, do we see that at like a population level? Or, well, that's, or am I misinterpreting that? Uh, you're misinterpreting it a little bit. Um, they eat white rice, right? Yeah. Why do they eat white, white rice? Because the rice bran is very full of omega-6 fats and it oxidizes quickly, right? So if, which would basically mean you would run out of food before your next rice harvest. So to make the rice more stable, you take off the rice bran, right? Turn bran rice into white rice, and you're removing all the omega-6 fats and creating a you know, just a starch and protein package, basically, mm -hmm. the rice grain, which is much more stable because it doesn't have any omega-6 fats in it. I mean, I feel like a broken record here at some point. <laughs> I mean, the same story over and over again, right? So at some point, they figured that out. And so they tend to eat white rice because mm. it's healthier. It doesn't go rancid on them, okay? We, in the West, figured out a way to process brown rice to make it more stable. There are a couple of patents, if you're really curious, on how to make brown rice a storable food, right? It's not naturally so. In the early 1900s, they made, you know, similarly to what I, the story I was telling you about cottonseed, they would wind up with a lot of brown of rice bran, right? And they didn't know what to do with it. So they tried feeding it to pigs and they found out that due to the high levels of omega-6 fats, the pigs' uh, fats would be altered and they would go from being nice firm fats with lots of saturated monounsaturated fats to this soft squishy fat that's full of polyunsaturated fat from the rice bran. And they determined that it was not suitable for feeding pigs because this type of fat was undesirable. Then we started feeding it to human children. Brilliant. Um, the obvious next step. Yeah, the <laughs> obvious next step. Oh, look, it's bad for pigs. Let's eat it ourselves. Give it to the kids. Um, yeah, you really can't make this stuff up. Um, so now, so that's an interesting phenomenon. At the same time, and I don't know what the linkage between if there is any between that and this ALDH two, two star two mutation is called, which is a down regulation of this uh, enzyme that detoxifies things. S seed oil toxic metabolites is only one of the things that it uh, detoxifies. The other thing and the reason it's famous is alcohol, right? So alcohol is metabolized into this thing called acetaldehyde. Seed oils break down into multiple different aldehydes, one of which is 4-hydroxynonanol, HNE, right? And uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, ALDH, detoxifies those two things and makes them harmless. So if you've ever heard of uh, Japanese people who flush mm -hmm. when they drink, um, it's because they are, they have this genetic mutation that among other things, and this is surprising, protects you from alcoholism, right? So if you have this mutation, you can't become an alcoholic because it's so unpleasant to consume alcohol. <laughs> so that may be the, that may it turn out be the benefit to the mutation in these populations, right? Because 
one of the things they pretty quickly figured out is that when you have a rice crop and you mill off the bran, if you ferment that stuff, it becomes alcohol, right? That's sake. So maybe you had this population that started rice agriculture and discovered that they were also producing a lot of alcohol and were drinking themselves into an early grave. And the people in that population who had this ALDH 2 star 2 mutation are protected from alcoholism. It's too unpleasant. So I don't know. I don't know if that's why they have that mutation, but that's one conceivable explanation, right? More, more study required, as the scientists like to say. Yeah. But it has this other effect that because they can't um, detoxify omega-6 fats, which in their traditional diets, they are not eating a lot of, so it doesn't matter, right? Because they're taking, they've realized through folk wisdom that that stuff is bad, that it makes your rice go bad and they're taking it out of their crop. So they don't have much of it in their natural diet. So they also don't, you know, when you start adding it back in because some American in a black ship came to your country and with a gun aimed at your head said, no, we are going to introduce the American diet and make you all eat seed oils, which is pretty much exactly what happened after World War II, by the way. Um, they get rates of these chronic diseases at higher levels than people who don't have this mutation do, which is a fine genetic knockout model, right? Physicians are really fond of these genetic knockout models where you find a person who has one mutation and it proves the validity of the mechanism you're proposing. Well, for seed oils and ill health, we have that. Yeah. I heard you say to Paul Saladino and Jeff Nobbs that there's literally no other explanation in the literature for what causes uh, cardiovascular disease than linoleic acid breaking down into these uh, oxidized metabolites. Yes, uh, well, that one, is true. One, and there's. Okay, I was going to say that yeah, I... Dr. Paul Mason and others have brought up this idea about plant sterols in seed oils, which or phytosterols, which is almost like plant cholesterol, which also seems to cause. Uh, atherosclerosis is that a concern as well it's a hypothesis um cardiologists like to tell people that they should consume phytosterols because it lowers ldl right okay but we already know ldl doesn't cause heart disease it is taken up in very small amounts um but is that you know i've never in the YouTube video where Dr. Mason introduces that hypothesis. There are lots of mites and maize. I've looked into it pretty extensively and I've not found any solid evidence for it. There was an experiment done. One of the other areas where this is a problem, the seed oil consumption is a problem, is uh, something called total parenteral nutrition, um, which is people who are born with a Typically, the typical model is a child's born with what's called short gut syndrome, where their small intestine is too short to allow them to absorb nutrients orally, and they have to give them intravenous nutrition. And the preferred intravenous nutrition since the 1960s has been soybean oil. Oh, great. Um, and it causes pretty reliably liver failure. Um, and soybeans and soybean oil also have phytosterols in them and these phytonutrients. And that was proposed as one of the reasons why they were having this problem, that it wasn't the fats, it was these other parts, other components. So now the, uh, the team of physicians and scientists up at the Boston Children's Hospital um, who started calling soybean oil the white death because of the effect it had on their patients, primarily liver failure, um, discovered that if they changed out the fat composition to fish oil, that they could not only prevent this liver failure from occurring in the first place, but it would actually cure the liver failure if it had already started to proceed. Right. So they did an experiment where they said, okay, we've got soybean oil here and fish oil here. Is it the fats or the phyto? 
nutrients in the soybean oil that's causing the problem. So they took the fish oil and they added in the phytonutrients from the soybean oil and it was harmless. So you'd have to do, they did this in animals. You'd have to do an experiment like that that would demonstrate that the phytosterols are what's driving um, cardiovascular disease. And I've not seen, I haven't spent a ton of time on this, but the standard model at this point experimentally is, you know, as I said, they've replicated this experiment lots of times where you feed humans different types of fats and then you test the oxidizability of the different, you know, mm. LDL molecules. Um, now, that said, Dr. Mason's making an excellent point that people don't really take up these plant sterols in any large amount sure. as opposed to cholesterol, which is the animal version of these molecules. I think anytime you're starting to stuff your body full of something it would prefer to avoid, you're probably mm. making a bad mistake. I think his, <laughs> and, uh, his concern. You know, I, I'm not going to rule out that they're playing some role, but I don't think it's the primary role. Yeah, okay. His, I think his concern was there are people with, so you normally absorb about 1%, I think he said, but some people right. have genetic mutations where they're absorbing more. And I think that's where he was saying for those people, especially, it could be causing issues. Yeah, and I, you know, I fully agree with them, you know, eat the, eat the fats you're supposed to be eating in the form you're supposed to be eating them, not mm. trying to trick your body. And I mean, so getting back to, you know, you saying uh, that in the early 1900s, we were eating most of the animal fats and not much in the neighborhood, much vegetable oils. That's exactly true. And if you look at what happened over the course of the 20th century, as heart disease increased, our consumption of these oils went up dramatically. It's been a single change in the diet, as I said. And we also started doing more of the things that cause them to oxidize in your body, smoking being a big one. I mean, if you look at the number of cigarettes that were produced at the beginning of the 20th century and in the middle of the 20th century, it's literally mind boggling how many billions of cigarettes people were smoking every year. Um, your doctor smokes. Just incredible. Right? And we know experimentally in humans that if you smoke a cigarette, it causes your oxidized LDL to go up, right? So we've demonstrated that. And there are other things that will do it. Like one, like we put lead in our gasoline, which seemed another thing that seemed like a good idea at the time. Lead is another thing that will cause oxidized, oxidative stress, which is the oxidation of these omega-6 fats in your blood vessels. So, you know, we were both, as you pointed out, consuming the tinder and adding the sparks via multiple mechanisms to cause the tinder to catch fire. Um, so where are we in the middle of the 20th century? We've got this epidemic of heart disease, as people like Dr. White pointed out, um, you know, the gentleman I mentioned who was the founder of the, one of the founders of the AHA and the founder of cardiology, um, or the father of cardiology. Um, so we're in the middle of the 20th century. We've got this epic of heart disease. What have we been doing up until that point at the epidemic is eating lots more seed oils. Then along comes this gentleman called Ansel Keys, and he says, this guy, we need to eat more seed oils and that will cure our epidemic of heart disease. <laughs> right? I mean, you look at the graph now and it's a joke because more. We're that's nearly what there. we've been doing, Doc. <laughs> just, just a bit more. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit more. One waffle and it will make you better. Um, it's like 50 Monty, obligatory Monty Python reference there. Um, and they had no evidence for this at that point. He had demonstrated that giving people seed oils causes their LDL to become lower. And it's thought that's because it alters how fats are metabolized in the liver, right? So they don't get, if they're not, if, you know, as I mentioned, LDL is this delivery vehicle for fats and cholesterol. So if you've got less fats to deliver and you're having trouble making LDL, you're going to have fewer LDL in your circulation. And that's, it's not as consistent as he made it out to be. There are experiments where that doesn't seem to happen, but it's pretty consistent. Um, so we'll give him that one, right? So he and the American Heart Association came out and said, 
you know, doctors like Dr. White had been pointing out, but in the early part of the 20th century, we weren't eating any of these things and we didn't have heart disease. So how can they be required to cure a heart disease? And they kind of poo-pooed him and, you know, ignored him. And in the early part, in 1961, uh, Keys and the American Heart Association came out and issued this nationwide recommendation that everybody should start eating polyunsaturated fats and avoid animal fats and incidentally trans fats, by the way, they knew that then that trans fats cause LDL to go up, synthetic trans fats anyway. Um, and they had no evidence that this would increase or decrease heart disease in humans, right? I've gone through the references. There was one study underway that would provide an answer to that but it had never been demonstrated other than the LDL lowering effect. So they just extrapolated, you know, we think LDL is related to heart disease. You find LDL in plaques, you know, just like with the antioxidants, they jumped the gun here. They didn't do the testing. Mm. So finally, so in 1965, they came out with a test called the Rose corn oil trial where they tried, um, uh, <laughs> where they tried corn oil for heart disease prevention and the people who got more corn oil got more heart disease. So they came to the conclusion, this is not a good idea. They did a couple of other studies that found the same thing. So finally Ansel Keys and the American Heart Association said, we have to do a big study to prove for once and for all that this is the right thing to do and that it will lower rates of heart disease in people. And this was called initially the National Diet Heart Study and then the Minnesota coronary survey survey was the final version of that protocol. And what they discovered was that the people who had more seed oils had more heart disease. Oops. And rather than come out and say, sorry, guys, we messed up. They stuffed the results and hit it until the 1980s. And then when it came out, they kind of downplayed it. But by then everybody was eating seed oils and this, you know, false dogma that seed oils were good for heart disease had become entrenched in the dietary guidelines and the American Heart Association recommendations. Um, a few years later, a French scientist demonstrated that if you eat fewer omega-6 fats, your heart disease rates will go far down. And they kind of buried that result as best they could, you know. So, yeah, if you go through, in 2020, the in 2017, the European Atherosclerosis Society came out with a study pointing the finger at LDL. And I guess they got a lot of pushback because in 2020, they came out with another version of the same paper in which they also pointed the finger at LDL. But in the first study, it was mostly associations. In the second study, they actually went through and looked at the mechanisms. And all the references are to the studies that I've been talking about here, where normal LDL is not atherogenic, only oxidized LDL is atherogenic. And even in the couple of places in their paper where they state that it's normal LDL, the references that they provide show that it's not normal LDL, it's only oxidized LDL that are driving this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just, you know, LDL is kind of collateral damage here because other scientists have discovered one of the big questions in the cardiology profession is where does this stuff get oxidized? And the cardiology profession has claimed that it happens in your arteries, right? But if we look at what's actually going on in the arteries, we find that the arteries preferentially take up not ApoB100, but ApoB48, right? That's the ApoB that's produced in the intestines. And we know that if you eat oxidized fats, they get packaged up in these ApoB48 chylomicrons and delivered throughout the body. Well, one of the places that avidly takes them up are your arteries. <laughs> and if you look in a plaque, you will find lots of these ApoB48 membranes, a disproportionate number of them based on their, you know, based on the quantity in the blood. So yes, you are eating oxidized oils and these oxidized oils are getting delivered into your arteries among, you know, along with every other part of your body, the oxidized Omega-6 fats are oxidizing the cholesterol and the oxidized cholesterol can oxidize other cholesterol model molecules like the BLDL and the LDL. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
That's, dope. That's where the science is right now. Okay. And, you know, if you talk to lots of cardiologists, you will hear them say things like APOB, LDL, and, but we all know now that those hypotheses have been debunked. Mm. Someone says that like the textbook's always like 20 years behind or something like that, or maybe more. Right. Right. Yeah, Dr. Berry talks about the echo of the lie, how people, even even if like the medical establishments took LDL off as like a thing of not to be worried about, people have been told it so much that like people will tell their friends like, oh, you can't, like if you're going on a carnival, or, the- or you can't do that because your LDL will go up. Right, right, yeah, and it's, you know, you know, folks who actually look at cardiac or at mortality curves, there've been a couple of analyses that have been done with mortality curves. So LDL is a, what they call a J curve, right? So if your LDL is too low, your mortality starts to go up. And if your LDL gets too high, your mortality also starts to go up in a disease called family familial hypercholesterolemia, those people don't have LDL receptors and they tend to have really high cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, you know, I mean, we all use the terms interchangeably, even though that's a horrible thing to do. Um, People with familial hypocholesterol don't have higher rates of cardiovascular disease unless they're eating an industrial diet, which means diet high in seed oils, right? But if you look at these mortality curves, you know, in populations eating high amounts of seed oils in industrial nations, um, the cholesterol targets now are down so far that they're actually where the curve starts going up again, (laughs) right? So that's what we all care about. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't care if I have atherosclerosis. I care if I get a heart attack and die at a young age right? There's a population in Africa, the um, uh, Maasai, mm-hmm. and a cardiologist went and I think he was a cardiologist, George Mann went and studied them in the early 1970s, trying to figure out if this diet heart hypothesis was true. And they go through a period where they eat lots of animal fat, nothing but animal fat, right? All they eat is blood, meat and milk. Mm-hmm. And their cholesterol goes down and they have very low rates of heart disease, virtually no heart attacks. And then he looked at their, at their arteries and they are tubes of fat. <laughs> it's unbelievable how much atherosclerosis they have, but they don't die of heart attacks. They live until they're a hundred years old. So who cares if you have atherosclerosis, if you can still fight a lion to the death with a spear in Africa and have hordes of children and live until you're 100 years old, right? I'll take that kind of atherosclerosis. Mm, yeah. But they don't die of heart attacks. That's what we care about, right? So in looking at LDL, you need to look at the mortality curves. And where I am is at the low end of the mortality curve. Even though I'm higher than a cardiologist says I should be, I'm eating a non-industrial diet effectively because I'm not eating seed oils. And even though my LD, my LDL and my cholesterol are high, I'm not worried about it because I'm still at the low end, even in populations eating an industrial diet, I'm in the lowest part of the mortality curve, which is what we care about. Mm, yeah, I heard Dr. Paul Saladino saying how a bit of atherosclerosis is actually natural. It's your body's uh, response to damage to the arterial wall. Right. And that's going to be caused by infection and, you know, it's just when you smoke from a campfire, mm. lots of things can cause when it gets completely a little bit of blocked, atherosclerosis. when your whole mm. artery is blocked, that's where you're going to get the problems. But it can happen healthily. Um, not, I'm not recommending people to on purposely get atherosclerosis, but it's well, I wouldn't yeah. say that it's health promoting, but it can be part of a healthy lifestyle. Yes, that's fair to say. Yeah, you mentioned eating fats in their proper form and how they were giving fish oil versus soybean oil to these children. Uh, and that was an animal model. An animal model. Oh, okay. Right. Um, I mean, there's soybean oil, fish oil. The phytosterol experiment was in animals. Yes, they have tried to replace soybean oil with fish oil because of the, because soybean oil is the white poison. 
out. Yes, so I heard you saying to Anthony Gustin that fish oil supplements oh, is a whole other conversation. And uh, you said it was better to eat fish in its natural form. Can we get into that a bit? Sure. So, I mean, you know, I had a really exp interesting experience with this. When I fixed my diet, I had been taking fish oil supplements for a number of years because of experiments that were done in the UK and based off some epidemiology done here by the National Institutes of Health, looking at um, violence, aggressive behavior, and fat intake. And the hypothesis was that high levels of omega-6 fats and low levels of omega-3 fats cause increased levels of violence and aggressive behavior in humans. So if you want to study that, where do you go? You go to a prison. <laughs> That's where the aggressive people are, <laughs> right? And they found that sure enough, if you gave them um, fish oil supplements, that they would be less aggressive, right? And there's been a number of other studies confirming those results. Unfortunately, you know, they often don't try and lower the omega-6, which I argue, and the fellow who did the original research argue is a necessary first step, but it doesn't always happen in a prison environment. So I started taking fish oil supplements before I actually fixed, fixed, fixed my diet based on that. I never noticed any difference. When I fixed my diet, I started taking uh, fermented cod liver oil um, and not taking it as a pill, but actually eating it with a spoon. And for the first six months, I couldn't get enough of that stuff. I couldn't go to bed at night. I would like wake up, you know, I'd start to fall off and I'd be like, oh, I haven't had my fish oil. And I would go get my spoon and eat it and it tasted it's, delicious. You were craving it? Um, you huh? were, you Were you craving it? You actually liked eating it or you felt that you craving had it, to? Craving it, liked eating it, yes. Mm, okay. And anybody who's ever been, you know, eating cod liver oil, I mean, my daughters rebelled against that vehemently, right? <laughs> And it turns out there was a fascinating experiment that was done in ch human children in the 1920s where a bunch of, in an orphanage, I think, a bunch of malnourished children in this orphanage were given free access to whatever foods they wanted to eat. And one of the kids had rickets. Cod liver oil is a rich source of vitamin D. And at the time I was doing this, I had broken six bones in the last two years. So I think I was borderline osteopenia. Um, you know, where your bones are starting to thin out and becoming weak. Um, so anyway, in this experiment, the kid who had rickets ate cod liver oil until he cured his rickets. And then he never touched it again. And that was basically my experience. For six months, I couldn't get enough of this stuff. And then I never had a drop of it ever since. Right? Just no interest, no appeal to it. Right? Um, so what I think is that if you're deficient in it, you should eat it. If And this goes for anything, right? If you're deficient in something, it's going to show benefit when you start adding it in. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you need gallons of this stuff, right? Which is what, where we are with cardiologists, where they're like, okay, you need to eat all these grams of omega-3 fats to help your heart disease. Well, that's not a normal part of the human diet either for most people oh, outside of the Japanese and the Inuit, right? Um, and the problem is it goes rancid in the, in the form that people eat it in a pill you know, I was eating this stuff with a spoon so I could smell. I mean, yes. you know, humans have exquisite detection mechanisms for oxidized omega-3 fats. It's rotten fish, right? <laughs> so if you're, but if you put it into a little tablet, you can't tell if it's oxidized. And oxidized fats are bad for you, right? Including omega-3 fats. So that's one aspect, right? If you're supplementing, long-term studies of supplementation with fish oil have found out that it tends to get harmful over time. And it's probably because you're eating oxidized fats and because you don't need all that much of it in your body, right? In a healthy diet context. The International Society for the Study of Fatty Acids and Lipids, ISFAL, I interviewed the president, former president, Tom Brenna, and their official position is there are two effective ways to lower the levels of omega-3 fats in the bloodstream. The first is supplementation and the second is reducing omega-6 intake because there seems to be a process of collateral damage where even if you're taking fish oil supplements, when you eat less 
when you eat more omega-6 fats, it's going to break down those long chain fats that your body needs. When you eat less of the omega-6, your body actually makes the longer chain omega-6 fat, or three fats that it needs, right? Mm. And there's a physician I talked to who did this experiment himself and cut back on his seed oil consumption and watched his omega-3 levels go up to the recommended level without ever consuming additional omega-3 omega fats so by a, a fish or by a supplementation. Increased right. omega-3s was supplementation or moving seed oils, omega-3s, right, in the blood? Right. Omega threes. Okay. So the first thing you should always do, I mean, supplementation short term, fine, right? But do it the way I did it. Eat it with a spoon. If you don't want it, you don't need it. Simple, right? Just like that kid in the orphanage. When he cured his rickets, he lost interest. Um, that's healthy. That's natural. That's how your body is designed to work. Right? Is it's... that you can sense, you know, nutrient deficiencies and you can correct them automatically. Humans have this ability to like every animal. So the other thing is choline, right? So omega-3 fats are very important in the brain and the eyes, right? Um, but when you take it in the supplement form, you're getting it in a triglyceride form, which is a glycerol backbone and three fats, right? And they take out all the rest of the stuff, right? But that's not how your body is supposed to be eating them. Your body is supposed to be getting it with... Um, my dog is attacking me here. Um, settle down, doggies. Um, you're supposed to be getting it with a chemical called choline, which is used to build the cell membranes, right? And you get it by eating things with cell membranes, like fish, Eggs. right? And when you eat omega-3 fats with choline, they are packaged together into the blood, into phospholipids in the blood. Mm -hmm. And these phospholipids are preferentially delivered to the brain, right? So if, so the long and short of that is don't eat fish oil, eat fish. Yeah. Right. And if you can't eat fish, like you're allergic to it or something, vehemently avoid omega-6 fats and eat things like pastured meats and pastured dairy that is going to have higher levels of omega-3 fats and lower levels of omega-6 fats and your body will take care of the rest eggs are also good for choline right eggs are great for choline the problem is eggs are it's really hard to find eggs that aren't super high in omega-6 fats because mm. chickens are monogasts and they concentrate those fats and that concentration goes through the eggs and we actually have a study in humans where they showed that increased level of industrial eggs causes increased levels of oxidized LDL in the blood mm. through the mechanisms we've already described. So if you can get omega-3 eggs or best or pastured eggs or farm eggs where the chickens are able to actually go out and eat what chickens want, which is chickens are omnivores, so they like eating critters and they should eat critters yeah. and they eat lots of grass which is high in omega-3s if you eat enough of it um so yeah so eggs eggs are an issue i eat vital farms um pastured eggs just because i like eggs and i think that's the best one that's easily available because it's really hard to get for me mm -hmm. to get vital farms uh, vital farms yeah and then um so that's, you know, my solution to the egg issue yeah. is, yeah, choline, you know, eggs have lots of choline, liver has choline, but also animal tissues have choline because they're made up of phospholipids, mm. yeah. which is where, you know, choline's bound to fats. I was interested in, like, what else you eat because I assume low pork, low chicken. Could you go into that a bit more? Yeah, a low pork. I virtually never eat chicken other than eggs. Um, I eat fish as frequently as I can. Idaho isn't a great place to be a fish eater. Um, I eat, my dairy is always organic and always, almost always pasture raised, right? Because of the better fatty acid profile. Um, people don't need to eat, eat fish to get enough omega-3 fats. You know, most people didn't live on the shore and still managed to get enough fatty acids to, you know, invent fire and all these other useful things we've done. Um, so, and you don't need much polyunsaturated fats in your diets. You don't need much omega-6 and you don't need much omega-3. So yeah. I don't think there's a benefit 
if you're eating a healthy diet, you know, to eat, you know, the Japanese and the Inuit weren't prior to eating industrial diets weren't as far as I've been able to tell categorically healthier or had category, you know, how do you have a lower rate of heart disease than zero, right? The Japanese had a super low rate of heart disease, but it wasn't actually zero. Uh, other populations who lived in the middle of Africa and were poor and weren't eating lots of seafood had zero rates of heart disease. So that's the, that's the thing I want to get to, right? I'm not interested in the cardiologist thing of, mm. oh, here's a statin and you lower your risk of heart disease by 20%, maybe. Uh, yeah. um, mm. I, I'm interested in how do I bring it to zero? And since there were human populations that did have zero, Eat like that. Zero ought to be attainable for us. I hope in the context of having grown up eating an industrial desire, diet. Yeah. That's, a, that's a key point that you need like a little bit of omega-6, but not tons and all fats. If you eat like beef, beef fat has some, like a little bit of omega-6. Like, so yeah, you don't need to mean, really go out your way to get it, right? It is, I will say this, it is categorically impossible to become deficient in omega-6 fats outside the care of a physician or if you're not in a laboratory mm. period never happened in human history wow right it is just impossible because the tiny amount that is in a healthy human diet which means eat, making sure you're getting your animal fats and not being a fruitarian or something stupid like that are going to have enough omega-6 fats and if you were not eating animals that have been depleted in omega-3 fats from an industrial diet you're going to get what you need from that assuming you're eating enough animal products mm -hmm. yeah one more thing uh, i'd like to ask is uh when you're speaking to max lukavir um you were talking about how you managed to get your dad off of like high blood pressure meds um and, and then and again, you mentioned that that's a whole other episode. What are your thoughts around that? What were you thinking then? Was it that you're not a massive fan of those medications or something? No, I was thinking that blood pressure is another industrial diet caused disease. Mm. If you look at these populations that don't have heart disease, they also don't have high blood pressure, right? And um, I'll tell you, you know, I hadn't met this guy at the time I fixed my dad's diet, but my partner in the podcast and in this company we're starting up is a physician and he had high blood pressure on a paleo diet two years ago. And since he was already eating a paleo diet, the only thing left for him to do was reduce his seed oil consumption because he was getting more seed oils than he knew he ought to. And he, you know, now has normal blood pressure. He sent me a text just over the weekend saying, I still have normal blood pressure a year and a half or whatever after I fix my diet and cut the seed oils out. So that's all I did with my dad is cut seed oils out, cut the carbohydrates out, which is a special case for when you're sick. Um, and increase his consumption of animal fats and dairy fats. And, you know, he, <laughs> that was a funny meeting. I was, so his doctor at that point was the physician I had fired after I fixed all of my health issues, who, um, you know, as physicians go, was a pretty good one. He was open-minded and willing to listen to me and realized pretty quickly that I knew what I was talking about. And in one of these, you know, my dad had had his physical and it came back that he had an HB A1C level of 6.4, right? 6.5 is diagnostic of diabetes. The physician had never told my father that he was a whisper away from diabetes. And my father, even though at this point, my father was suffering from all the side effects of being a diabetic because of that 0.1%. I mean, it was ridiculous. And he said, well, we, re we don't really have a treat. He said to us, we don't really have a treatment for diabetes at this level. And I looked at him and I said, doc, diabetes is easy. I'll take care of that. <laughs> Two months later, we came back, did another blood test. My father's HbA1c was at 5.6, the same level as the physicians. Amazing. So, and his, he lost all of his extra body weight and had to buy new clothes. 
is kind of the most painful part of this process is blood pressure normalized. That's a whole nother long story, but yeah, his blood pressure, he went normalized to the extent where he actually passed out and had to go to the emergency room because the physician wouldn't take him off the blood pressure lowering meds. And my father, not being a rebel like me, wasn't willing to just stop taking him. But I mean, my wife was on blood pressure lowering meds and her blood pressure went down when she fixed her diet at this point. It seems to be, you can find in the literature studies saying that linoleic acid causes blood pressure in humans, wow. blood pressure elevation in humans. Mm. Yeah, I wanna start, start to wrap it up here, uh, but I quickly wanted to talk, like mention dementia and uh, like Alzheimer's and sunburn and how these fats accumulating in those tissues becoming oxidized seems to be leading to sunburn and also degeneration of the brain. Um. Yeah, well, it, you know, as I mentioned, radiation will cause these fats to break down. In fact, the toxic effect of radiation, they did a study in the 1950s where they're trying to figure out why radiation is toxic and they discovered it's because it oxidizes linoleic acid. That was the conclusion of the study. <laughs> the answer to everything. <laughs> and, you know, which is not saying you want to use say x-rays to cure your athlete's foot although i will observe that the scientist who set the exposure levels for x-rays did actually use x-rays to cure his athlete's foot and died at i think 103. <laughs> so it's conceivable that radiation is much less harmful in the context of a natural natural diet we certainly, when we're on a natural diet, we don't get skin cancer the way we do on an industrial diet. That's the U.S. Navy, I think, did a study looking at an indigenous population in South America where they found that. And, you know, if you look, they've done studies in humans where, you know, one area of the arm gets exposed to ultraviolet radiation and the other doesn't. And what goes up in the burned area, it's the same oxidized metabolites of linoleic acid that we're talk we've are talking. we been talking about through this whole thing. Um, and so one of the common effects that people find when they fix their diet is that they become much more resistant to sunburn. Resistant does not mean impervious. If you, if you aren't in the sun all winter, don't do what I did this year and go on a three-hour trail run without wearing a shirt because you will get burned. But... The second time I did that and I was out in the sun for five hours, no burn. Um, you will get still get a sunburn, but you will be far less susceptible to it. My time to burn went from like 45 minutes to now, you know, in after I've reacclimated to sun exposure, um, seven, eight hours before I'll get a burn, um, which is huge lifestyle. And there are so many people who've reported that at this point that I've, you know, on my blog, I've got a couple of compendiums of anecdotes on how common that happens. Um, the plural of anecdotes is data. Beg your pardon? I, I love your uh, Twitter um, Twitter bio. The plural of anecdotes is data. Yeah, doctors drive... It, that drives doctors crazy. Doctors are wrong on that. The plural of... Plural, that quote is from a Nobel Prize winning economist plural of anecdote is indeed data because I mean that's what the nature of the VAERS vaccine side effect reporting system is collect enough anecdotes about what happens to people after they take a vaccine and if there's something bad going on it'll probably show up in that data because it's data not just anecdotes mm -hmm. um, Alzheimer's all the neurodegenerative diseases have a strong oxidative stress component when I say oxidative stress, the way they usually measure it is through oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. Um, if you, I mean, science has been chasing beta amyloid plaques as the cause of Alzheimer's disease for decades now. Every single trial, including the drugs that just came on the market, trying to treat it through that pathway has failed. Um, how do you induce beta amyloid plaques in a Alzheimer's model? you inject HNE, this oxidized linoleic acid metabolite into the brain. In humans, HNE is found in high levels in the areas that are undergoing degradation. So it looks 
you know, I interviewed this guy who's a neuroscientist, um, Amir Taha, and uh, he's done a lot of research on neurodevelopment and omega-6 and omega-3 fats. And I asked him the billion dollar question. If you were given a billion dollars and you wanted to undergo a field of study, what would you want to do? And his answer was, I would want to prove that linoleic acid causes heart disease or causes Alzheimer's disease. Mm. And I think, you know, you look at the mechanisms, it's the same story that we started out with. It's mitochondrial dysfunction. One of the first things that happens is an inability to use uh, glucose as a fuel, which is why, because of damage to the mitochondrial electron transport chain, which is why ketones can be beneficial in Alzheimer's disease because that they bypass that pathway. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, one of the few conditions that's well recognized in medicine to be caused by excess omega-6 fat um, intake is the most common cause of blindness, age-related macular degeneration. And the scientists who are studying that find beta amyloid plaques in the eyes, and they actually call it Alzheimer's of the eyes. So, and when you read the research about age-related macular degeneration, you realize it's the exact same process that's going on in atherosclerosis and in diabetes and everywhere else. You get these, you know, this immune reaction to these oxidized fats and the body it starts attacking the body. The oxidized fats are toxic. They cause this tissue breakdown. The brain, unfortunately, is one of the least susceptible to mm. tissues to oxidized stress, oxidative stress. Nice. So it's, you know. Mm. Yeah. Final, final question. Uh, promise this time, right? Uh, I was, if you don't mind, like, how old are you, Tucker? Uh, fifty-five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, you look good, man. I was, I was wondering because I heard you talking about how in your late thirties you started to uh, kind of look into this health thing uh, a bit more. But yeah. Well, that was that was one of the first things that happened, actually. And that was why a lot of people at my office started asking me because I literally started looking 15 years younger mm. in the course of a couple of months. And people were just coming up to me and, you know, what are you doing? Why do you look so much? And I mean, at that point, I'd been hospitalized multiple times, including straight out of the office. Mm. <laughs> so everybody knew I had health issues and, you know, I think probably one of the neatest things that happened to me was I, within a couple of months of fixing my diet, I got carted by a gay bartender, <laughs> which is quite the compliment. You know, here I am 41, 42 at that point, And he thinks I'm 18 or 21. Um, I was like, okay, this is cool. I'll take that. Sadly with the whiteness in the beard, which I didn't have at the time, that doesn't happen anymore. But you know, it was pretty fun at that time. Yeah, guys, stop eating cereals and you can look like Tucker. So, yeah, it's, you know, and I, you know, it's not just appearance. I uh, became a ski patroller this winter and I'm out skiing around with people who are in their 20s and I'm physically at the same level as anybody who's three decades younger than I am. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah, I really like appreciate what you're doing. I think it's when I started to dig into this, I was just like kind of mind blown and like it's almost a, a bit annoying how so many of these disease like people think dementia is just like you can't do anything about it, right? Old age, right? Yeah, and and starting to get into this, like I'm glad I did because hopefully I can help people avoid this and myself. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate you being one of those people like on the forefront. Um, I'll definitely learn a lot from your work. So thanks. That's well, that's why I'm doing it. I'm glad, glad to hear that it's, you know, keep it going. Blown your mind. That's the point. <laughs> Blow your mind, change your behavior, and hopefully you will avoid being a victim of the medical system for the rest of your life. Mm, yeah. Where can people support you find more of your work? Well, I'm, uh, I'll disclose that I'm working with two companies. Um, one of them is called Zero Acre Farms, and they are producing a low linoleic 
seed oil alternative. Um, you'll find them at zeroacrefarms.com. I think it's the URL. I should know that. I'll find it. I've put it in. Yeah, I've. Uh, we're putting together a bunch of white papers. They are committed to spreading the scientific evidence for this. So we've done a heart disease white paper and have a cancer white paper coming out soon, um, going through all of this research that I've talked about. So I highly recommend, you know, both looking into their product and looking at all the research that we're putting up there. Um, I'm involved in a startup with my partner, the physician who uh, called CD. Um, the web URL there is cdapp.com. And that is a tool that we're putting together to help people find low linoleic foods in the supermarket, um, in the supermarkets starting in the United States, but hopefully we'll get over to the UK soon. Um, I have a blog yelling dash stop.blogspot.com where I have some ridiculous number of posts looking at this stuff. I have a YouTube channel. Um, if you search, YouTube for Tucker Goodrich and a podcast called Tucker Goodrich. Um, you'll find that including some of the interviews I've discussed here. Um, and I'm really active on Twitter and my handle is Tucker Goodrich. So it should be easy to find it will be and I post yeah. as you know, I'm sure lots of research all the time looking at into various pulling various different threads and trying to figure out, you know, more evidence for why this is a bad idea because I don't think you can ever have enough evidence. Um, Although when I started doing this, I used to have panic attacks every time I would find a new study because I'd be like, oh my God, is this the one that's going to disprove me? And at this point, I don't have those panic attacks because the amount of evidence is so overwhelming um, that, you know, I'm pretty comfortable saying that this is solid. Yeah, it would take some serious evidence to convince you otherwise now. I think so. Yeah, we'll, 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 I'll put those links uh, to your stuff in the description of the podcast. I would just say, have you considered maybe having a more, like for the name of your blog, something that's a bit more, I don't know, <laughs> relatable yeah, to you? Yeah, it's horrible, and the blog stinks. Um, the first time I, I saw that more name. on the content than the appearance. My daughter has actually been, uh, my daughter and my wife are both, Two of the people who are like, you have to fix this. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not against the layout. I'm more like the URL. If it would be like tuckergoodrich.com or something, because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, where that's, can you find my stuff? And I, I don't know what it is, you know. But yeah, that's on the to-do list uh, for sure, but just not high priority because I don't yeah really care about the optics of it. I'm afraid to say I'm terrible at marketing. Fair enough. Um, the name of the blog comes from uh, saying by an American political philosopher, William Buckley, who said, uh, we shall stand athwart, stand athwart history yelling stop. And I think with the focus of an ancestral mm. diet and barefoot running that I really, that, that it's a perfect mm. statement. Um, a couple of physicians that. actually wrote a paper years later, uh, using that same quote and advocating for conservative medicine which is medicine that's solidly backed in science, which sadly it turns out isn't what most medicine is. Most 90% of medicine is not solidly backed by scientific science and scientific evidence. So mm -hmm. I think I like the name, even though people say it's kind of argumentative, but you know, it's a bit. <laughs> New isn't always better. Yeah. I really appreciate this Tucker. Um, hope I haven't taken oh, been great. too much of your time. I hope we'll be able to get into some things that are a bit different from, uh, your previous podcast. Um, thanks. Thank you, Owen. It's been a terrific conversation, and I hope your uh, your listeners find it to be valuable. Thank you, Tucker. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Talk to you later.